Should I go to grad school or work first? You're about to graduate college, and you're facing a big choice, attend graduate school or pursue a full-time job. Though one particular answer may not be the right one for everyone, it depends on your priorities that define the answer. For some, given their goals and passions, the answer may be clear. But for many others, this decision can be a real struggle. While looking for a job, employers look at both educational qualifications and work experience. Educational qualifications let the employer know that you have the skill and technical know-how to perform. In contrast work experience eliminates the time and money an employer may have to spend on training a candidate. While some would argue that educational qualification is directly proportional to the level of job you get, others would say that education has least to do with your job. It is only the experience you have that ultimately matters. When it comes to answering the question of higher education or job, some people say that higher education prepares you for the skills required in the future. Many times theory teaches you what your experience cannot. On the other hand, many are of the opinion that taking up a job and gaining experience is much more necessary than pursuing a higher degree. When it comes to deciding between a job or higher education, one must definitely opt for a job. Apart from degrees of education, employers look at work experience while studying. And, degrees have nothing to do with the level of output. The best example is that of Steve Job, co-founder of Apple Inc. Apparently, Steve Jobs had not finished any formal degree of education. In fact, he dropped out of college after one semester, and his highest qualification was high school. Therefore, it is evident that the level of education has nothing to do with your capabilities. In case you haven't noticed, HR culture is changing. More and more companies are dropping any form of degree requirement from their job postings, we all have to start somewhere. It's about what you do with your time that matters. Below are three points you should consider if faced with a similar decision. Have an honest conversation with yourself. Four years of college is a long time and after years of rigorous study, you may feel burned out and uncertain about jumping back into several more of graduate-level academics. To examine your motivations and mental state, ask yourself the following questions. Is the topic you'll be studying something you're passionate about and can see a future in? Why do you think grad school is the next best step? How does the prospect of graduate school make you feel? Consider the flexibility of your options. If you're not ready to turn down grad school right away, deferring your acceptance by a semester or a year and accepting a job offer in the meantime may be possible. When deferring, schools may require a rationale, outlining your personal or professional reasons for requesting a gap year and a timeline for what you plan to do during this time. This option can give you breathing room to make a more informed decision while gaining on the job training and other professional skills. Alternatively, if you're still in the application phase, consider programs that incorporate both a job and graduate school. While this type of program is dominated by Masters of Business Administration programs, you may find programs that offer work-study or on-site training in addition to an academic curriculum. Weigh the costs, it can be helpful to review your current student loans, if any, while weighing the additional cost of grad school against your expected postgraduate salary can be considered delaying or going part-time. If you don't have the money saved to go to school or other financial support, consider putting the dream on hold for a year or two so you can save up not only tuition costs, but also living expenses. You should also consider taking classes part-time. It might take you twice as long to finish, but when you do graduate, you'll be glad you own that degree. Some graduate programs, specifically medical and law school, are a requirement for those seeking to become professionals in that field. But grad school isn't always necessary for other fields. There are tons of other professions that you'd be surprised to know do not require to go to school. Unfortunately, we've been fed the lie for far too long that you need an education no matter what career you want to pursue there are plenty of great paying jobs out there where the knowledge and training needed can easily be found in the real world. So, determining what suits you is more important. Sometimes financial constraints can drive one to take the decision to work rather than to study further. Or an economic slowdown can make a student study further rather than look for a job, 
so whatever you choose to do definitely depends on the circumstances you are in. Ultimately, both education and work experience go hand in hand when it comes to brighter career prospects. Work, human activity. Work or labor, or labor in British English, is intentional activity people perform to support themselves, others, or the needs and wants of a wider community. Alternatively, work can be viewed as the human activity that contributes, along with other factors of production, towards the goods and services within an economy. Work is fundamental to all societies, but can vary widely within and between them, from gathering in natural resources by hand, to operating complex technologies that substitute for physical or even mental effort by many human beings. All but the simplest tasks also require specific skills, equipment or tools, and other resources, such as material for manufacturing goods. Cultures and individuals across history have expressed a wide range of attitudes towards work. Outside of any specific process or industry, humanity has developed a variety of institutions for situating work in society. Besides objective differences, one culture may organize or attach social status to work roles differently from another. Throughout history, work has been intimately connected with other aspects of society and politics, such as power, class, tradition, rights, and privileges. Accordingly, the division of labor is a prominent topic across the social sciences, as both an abstract concept and a characteristic of individual cultures. Description, work can take many different forms, as various as the environments, tools, skills, goals, and institutions around a worker. Because sustained effort is a necessary part of many human activities, what qualifies as work is often a matter of context. Specialization is one common feature that distinguishes work from other activities. For example, a sport is a job for a professional athlete who earns their livelihood from it, but a hobby to someone playing for fun in their community. An element of advanced planning or expectation is also common, such as when a paramedic provides medical care while on duty and fully equipped, rather than performing first aid off duty as a bystander in an emergency. Self care and basic habits like personal grooming are also not typically considered work either. While a later gift, trade, or payment may retroactively affirm an activity as productive, this can exclude work like volunteering or activity within a family setting, like parenting or housekeeping. In some cases, the distinction between work and other activities is simply a matter of common sense within a community. However, an alternative view is that labeling any activity as work is somewhat subjective. History, humans have varied their work habits and attitudes to work over the course of time. Hunter-gatherer societies vary their work intensity according to seasonal availability of plants and the periodic migration of prey animals. The development of agriculture led to more sustained work practices, but work still changed with the seasons, with intense sustained effort during harvests, for example, alternating with less focused periods such as winters. In the early modern era, Protestantism and proto-capitalism emphasized the moral-slash-personal advantages of hard work. The periodic reinvention of slavery encouraged more consistent work activity in the working class, and capitalist industrialization intensified demands on workers to keep up with the pace of machines. Restrictions on the hours of work and the ages of workers followed, with worker demands for time off increasing but modern office work retains traces of expectations of sustained, concentrated work, even in affluent societies. Kinds of work, there are several ways to categorize and compare different kinds of work. In economics, one popular approach is the three-sector model or variations of it. In this view, an economy can be separated into three broad categories. Primary sector, which extracts food, raw materials, and other resources from the environment. Secondary sector, which manufactures physical products, refines materials, and provides utilities. Tertiary sector, which provides services and helps administer the economy. 
In complex economies with high specialization, these categories are further subdivided into industries that produce a focused subset of products or services. Some economists also propose additional sectors such as a knowledge-based quaternary sector, but this division is neither standardized nor universally accepted. Another common way of contrasting work roles is ranking them according to a criterion, such as the amount of skill, experience, or seniority associated with a role. The progression from apprentice through journeyman to master craftsman in the skilled trades is one example with a long history and analogues in many cultures. Societies also commonly rank different work roles by perceived status, but this is more subjective and goes beyond clear progressions within a single industry. Some industries may be seen as more prestigious than others overall, even if they include roles with similar functions. At the same time, a wide swath of roles across all industries may be afforded more status, e.g. managerial roles, or less, like manual labor, based on characteristics such as a job being low-paid or dirty, dangerous, and demeaning. Other social dynamics, like how labor is compensated, can even exclude meaningful tasks from a society's conception of work. For example, in modern market economies where wage labor or piece work predominates, unpaid work may be omitted from economic analysis or even cultural ideas of what qualifies as work. At a political level, different roles can fall under separate institutions where workers have qualitatively different power or rights. In the extreme, the least powerful members of society may be stigmatized, as in untouchability, or even violently forced, via slavery, into performing the least desirable work. Complementary to this, elites may have exclusive access to the most prestigious work, largely symbolic sinecures, or even a life of leisure. Workers, individual workers, require sufficient health and resources to succeed in their tasks. Physiology, as living beings, humans require a baseline of good health, nutrition, rest, and other physical needs in order to reliably exert themselves. This is particularly true of physical labor that places direct demands on the body, but even largely mental work can cause stress from problems like long hours, excessive demands, or a hostile workplace. Particularly intense forms of manual labor often lead workers to develop physical strength necessary for their job. However, this activity does not necessarily improve a worker's overall physical fitness like exercise due to problems like overwork or a small set of repetitive motions. In these physical jobs, maintaining good posture or movements with proper technique is also a crucial skill for avoiding injury. Ironically, white-collar workers who are sedentary throughout the workday may also suffer from long-term health problems due to a lack of physical activity. Training, learning the necessary skills for work, is often a complex process in its own right, requiring intentional training. In traditional societies, know-how for different tasks can be passed to each new generation through oral tradition and working under adult guidance. For work that is more specialized and technically complex, however, a more formal system of education is usually necessary. A complete curriculum ensures that a worker in training has some exposure to all major aspects of their specialty, in both theory and practice. Equipment and technology, tool use has been a central aspect of human evolution and is also an essential feature of work. Even in technologically advanced societies, many workers' tool sets still include a number of smaller hand tools, designed to be held and operated by a single person, often without supplementary power. This is especially true when tasks can be handled by one or a few workers, don't require significant physical power, and are somewhat self-paced, like in many services or handicraft manufacturing. For other tasks needing large amounts of power, such as in the construction industry or involving a highly repetitive set of simple actions, like in mass manufacturing, complex machines can carry out much of the effort. The workers present will focus on more complex tasks, operating controls, or performing maintenance. 
over several millennia, invention, scientific discovery, and engineering principles have allowed humans to proceed from creating simple machines that merely redirect or amplify force through engines for harnessing supplementary power sources to today's complex, regulated systems that automate many steps within a work process. In the 20th century, the development of electronics and new mathematical insights led to the creation and widespread adoption of fast, general-purpose computers. Just as mechanization can substitute for the physical labor of many human beings, computers allow for the partial automation of mental work previously carried out by human workers, such as calculations, document transcription, and basic customer service requests. Research and development of related technologies like machine learning and robotics continues into the 21st century, beyond tools and machines used to actively perform tasks, workers benefit when other passive elements of their work and environment are designed properly. This includes everything from personal items like workwear and safety gear to features of the workspace itself like furniture, lighting, air quality, and even the underlying architecture. In society, organizations. Even if workers are personally ready to perform their jobs, coordination is required for any effort outside of individual subsistence to succeed. At the level of a small team working on a single task, only cooperation and good communication may be necessary. As the complexity of a work process increases though, requiring more planning or more workers focused on specific tasks, a reliable organization becomes more critical. Institutions, the need for planning and coordination extends beyond individual organizations to society as a whole too. Every successful work project requires effective resource allocation to provide necessities, materials, and investment, such as equipment and facilities. In smaller, traditional societies, these aspects can be mostly regulated through custom, though as societies grow, more extensive methods become necessary. Without social support or other resources, however, the necessity of earning a livelihood may force a worker to cede some rights and freedoms in fact. Values, societies and subcultures may value work in general, or specific kinds of it, very differently. When social status or virtue is strongly associated with leisure and opposed to tedium, then work itself can become indicative of low social rank and devalued. In the opposite case, a society may hold strongly to a work ethic where work itself is seen as virtuous. Current issues, slave labor and human trafficking, unemployment, when governments fail to account for work occurring out of view from the public sphere. A school is an educational institution designed to provide learning spaces and learning environments for the teaching of students under the direction of teachers. Most countries have systems of formal education, which is sometimes compulsory. In these systems, students progress through a series of schools. The names for these schools vary by country but generally include primary school for young children and secondary school for teenagers who have completed primary education. An institution where higher education is taught is commonly called a university college or university. In addition to these core schools, students in a given country may also attend schools before and after primary, elementary in the U.S., and secondary, middle school in the U.S., education. Kindergarten or preschool provides some schooling to very young children, typically ages 3 to 5. University, vocational school, college or seminary may be available after secondary school. A school may be dedicated to one particular field, such as a school of economics or dance. Alternative schools may provide non-traditional curriculum and methods. Non-government schools, also known as private schools, may be required when the government does not supply adequate or specific educational needs. Other private schools can also be religious, such as Christian schools, gurukula, Hindu schools, madrasa, Arabic schools, hazas, Shari Muslim schools, yeshivas, Jewish schools, and others, or schools that have a higher standard of education or seek to foster other personal achievements.
Schools for adults include institutions of corporate training, military education, and training and business schools. Critics of school often accuse the school system of failing to adequately prepare students for their future lives, of encouraging certain temperaments while inhibiting others, of prescribing students exactly what to do, how, when, where and with whom, which would suppress creativity, and of using extrinsic measures such as grades and homework which would inhibit children's natural curiosity and desire to learn. In homeschooling and distance education, teaching and learning take place independent from the institution of school or in a virtual school outside a traditional school building, respectively. Schools are organized in several different organizational models, including departmental, small learning communities, academies, integrated, and schools within a school. History and Development the concept of grouping students together in a centralized location for learning has existed since classical antiquity. Formal schools have existed at least since ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient India, and ancient China. The Byzantine Empire had an established schooling system beginning at the primary level. According to traditions and encounters, the founding of the primary education system began in 425 AD and, military personnel usually had at least a primary education. The sometimes efficient and often large government of the empire meant that educated citizens were a must. Although Byzantium lost much of the grandeur of Roman culture and extravagance in the process of surviving, the empire emphasized efficiency in its war manuals. The Byzantine education system continued until the empire's collapse in 1453 AD. In Western Europe, a considerable number of cathedral schools were founded during the early Middle Ages in order to teach future clergy and administrators, with the oldest still existing, and continuously operated, cathedral schools being the King's School, Canterbury, established 597 CE, King's School, Rochester, established 604 CE, St. Peter's School, York, established 627 CE, and Thetford Grammar School, established 631 CE. Beginning in the 5th century CE, monastic schools were also established throughout Western Europe, teaching religious and secular subjects. Islam was another culture that developed a school system in the modern sense of the word. Emphasis was put on knowledge, which required a systematic way of teaching and spreading knowledge and purpose-built structures. At first, mosques combined religious performance and learning activities. However, by the 9th century, the madrasa was introduced, a school that was built independently from the mosque, such as al karawayan founded in 859 CE. They were also the first to make the madrasa system a public domain under caliph's control. Under the Ottomans, the towns of Bursa and Adirna became the main centers of learning. The Ottoman system of Kulai, a building complex containing a mosque, a hospital, madrasa, and public kitchen and dining areas, revolutionized the education system, making learning accessible to a broader public through its free meals, health care, and sometimes free accommodation. In Europe, universities emerged during the 12th century, here, scholasticism was an important tool, and the academicians were called schoolmen. During the Middle Ages and much of the early modern period, the main purpose of schools, as opposed to universities, was to teach the Latin language. This led to the term grammar school, which in the United States informally refers to a primary school, but in the United Kingdom means a school that selects entrance based on ability or aptitude. The school curriculum has gradually broadened to include literacy in the vernacular language and technical, artistic, scientific, and practical subjects. Obligatory school attendance became common in parts of Europe during the 18th century. In Denmark, Norway, this was introduced as early as in 1739 to 1741, the primary end being to increase the literacy of the Almu, i.e., the regular people. Many of the earlier public schools in the United States and elsewhere were one-room schools where a single teacher taught seven grades of boys and girls in the same classroom. Beginning in the 1920s, one-room schools were consolidated into multiple classroom facilities with transportation increasingly provided by kid hacks and school buses. Ownership and Operation Many schools are owned or funded by states. Private schools operate independently from the government. 
Private schools usually rely on fees from families whose children attend the school for funding, however, sometimes such schools also receive government support, for example, through school vouchers. Many private schools are affiliated with a particular religion, these are known as parochial schools. Components of most schools, schools are organized spaces purposed for teaching and learning. The classrooms where teachers teach and students learn are of central importance. Classrooms may be specialized for certain subjects, such as laboratory classrooms for science education and workshops for industrial arts education. Typical schools have many other rooms and areas, which may include cafeteria, commons, dining hall or canteen where students eat lunch and often breakfast and snacks, athletic field, playground, gym, or track place where students participating in sports or physical education practice, schoolyards, all-purpose playfields typically in elementary schools, often made of concrete, auditorium or hall where student theatrical and musical productions can be staged and where all school events such as assemblies are held, office where the administrative work of the school is done, library where students ask librarians reference questions, check out books and magazines, and often use computers. Computer labs where computer-based work is done and the internet accessed, cultural activities where the students uphold their cultural practice through activities like games, dance, and music. Education facilities in low-income countries, in low-income countries, only 32% of primary, 43% of lower secondary and 52% of upper secondary schools have access to electricity. This affects access to the internet, which is just 37% in upper secondary schools in low-income countries, as compared to 59% in those in middle-income countries and 93% in those in high-income countries. Access to basic water, sanitation, and hygiene is also far from universal. Among upper secondary schools, only 53% in low-income countries and 84% in middle-income countries have access to basic drinking water. Access to water and sanitation is universal in high-income countries. Security, the safety of staff and students is increasingly becoming an issue for school communities, an issue most schools are addressing through improved security. Some have also taken measures such as installing metal detectors or video surveillance. Others have even taken measures such as having the children swipe identification cards as they board the school bus. These plans have included door numbering to aid public safety response for some schools. Other security concerns faced by schools include bomb threats, gangs, and vandalism. In recognition of these threats, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal for Advocates for Upgrading Education Facilities to Provide a Safe, Nonviolent Learning Environment. Health services, school health services are services from medical, teaching, and other professionals applied in or out of school to improve the health and well-being of children and, in some cases, whole families. These services have been developed in different ways around the globe. However, the fundamentals are constant. The early detection, correction, prevention, or amelioration of disease, disability, and abuse from which school-aged children can suffer. Online schools and classes. Some schools offer remote access to their classes over the internet. Online schools also can provide support to traditional schools, as in the case of the school Net Namibia. Some online classes also provide experience in a class. When people take them, they have already been introduced to the subject and know what to expect. Classes provide high school slash college credit, allowing students to take the classes at their own pace. Many online classes cost money to take, but some are offered free. Internet-based distance learning programs are offered widely through many universities. Instructors teach through online activities and assignments. Online classes are taught the same as in person, with the same curriculum. The instructor offers the syllabus with their fixed requirements like any other class. Students can virtually turn their assignments into their instructors according to deadlines, this being through via email or on the course web page. This allows students to work at their own pace yet meet the correct deadlines.
Students taking an online class have more flexibility in their schedules to take their classes at a time that works best. Conflicts with taking an online class may include not being face-to-face -face with the instructor when learning or being in an environment with other students. Online classes can also make understanding the content challenging, especially when unable to get in quick contact with the instructor. Online students have the advantage of using other online sources with assignments or exams for that specific class. Online classes also have the advantage of students not needing to leave their house for a morning class or worrying about their attendance for that class. Students can work at their own pace to learn and achieve within that curriculum. The convenience of learning at home has been an attraction point for enrolling online. Students can attend class anywhere a computer can go, at home, in a library, or while traveling internationally. Online school classes are designed to fit a student's needs while allowing students to continue working and tending to their other obligations. Online school education is divided into three subcategories, online elementary school, online middle school, online high school. Stress, as a profession, teaching has levels of work-related stress, WRS, that are among the highest of any profession in some countries, such as the United Kingdom and the United States. The degree of this problem is becoming increasingly recognized and support systems are being put into place. Stress sometimes affects students more severely than teachers, up to the point where the students are prescribed stress medication. This stress is claimed to be related to standardized testing and the pressure on students to score above average. According to a 2008 mental health study by the Associated Press and MTVU, 8 in 10 U.S. college students said they had sometimes or frequently experienced stress in their daily lives. This was an increase of 20% from a survey five years previously. 34% had felt depressed at some point in the past three months, 13% had been diagnosed with a mental health condition such as an anxiety disorder or depression, and 9% had seriously considered suicide. Discipline towards students, schools and their teachers have always been under pressure, for instance, pressure to cover the curriculum, perform well compared to other schools, and avoid the stigma of being soft or spoiling towards students. Forms of discipline, such as control over when students may speak, and normalized behavior, such as raising a hand to speak, are imposed in the name of greater efficiency. Practitioners of critical pedagogy maintain that such disciplinary measures have no positive effect on student learning. Indeed, some argue that disciplinary practices detract from learning, saying that they undermine students' dignity and sense of self-worth, the latter occupying a more primary role in students' hierarchy of needs. Motivation Motivation is the reason for which humans and other animals initiate, continue, or terminate a behavior at a given time. Motivational states are commonly understood as forces acting within the agent that create a disposition to engage in goal-directed behavior. It is often held that different mental states compete with each other and that only the strongest state determines behavior. This means that we can be motivated to do something without actually doing it. The paradigmatic mental state providing motivation is desire, but various other states, such as beliefs about what one ought to do or intentions, may also provide motivation. Motivation is derived from the word motive, which denotes a person's needs, desires, wants, or urges. It is the process of motivating individuals to take action in order to achieve a goal. The psychological elements fueling people's behavior in the context of job goals might include a desire for money. Various competing theories have been proposed concerning the content of motivational states. They are known as content theories and aim to describe what goals usually or always motivate people. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the ERG theory, for example, posit that humans have certain needs, which are responsible for motivation. Some of these needs, like for food and water, are more basic than other needs, such as for respect from others. On this view, the higher needs can only provide motivation once the lower needs have been fulfilled. Behaviorist theories try to explain behavior solely in terms of the relation between the situation and external, observable behavior without explicit reference to conscious mental states. 
Motivation may be either intrinsic, if the activity is desired because it is inherently interesting or enjoyable, or extrinsic, if the agent's goal is an external reward distinct from the activity itself. It has been argued that intrinsic motivation has more beneficial outcomes than extrinsic motivation. Motivational states can also be categorized according to whether the agent is fully aware of why he acts the way he does or not, referred to as conscious and unconscious motivation. Motivation is closely related to practical rationality. A central idea in this field is that we should be motivated to perform an action if we believe that we should perform it. Failing to fulfill this requirement results in cases of irrationality, known as acrasia or weakness of the will, in which there is a discrepancy between our beliefs about what we should do and our actions. Research on motivation has been employed in various fields. In the field of business, a central question concerns work motivation, for example, what measures an employer can use to ensure that his employees are motivated. Motivation is also of particular interest to educational psychologists because of its crucial role in student learning. Specific interest has been given to the effects of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation in this field. Types of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic, intrinsic motivation exists within the individual and is driven by satisfying internal rewards rather than relying on external pressures or extrinsic rewards. It involves an interest in or enjoyment of the activity itself. Pursuing challenges and goals comes easier and is more enjoyable when one is intrinsically motivated to complete a certain objective, for example, because the individual is more interested in learning rather than achieving the goal. It has been argued that intrinsic motivation is associated with increased subjective well-being and that it is important for cognitive, social, and physical development. It can also be observed in animal behavior, for example, when organisms engage in playful and curiosity-driven behaviors in the absence of reward. Intrinsic motivation tends to be more long-lasting, self-sustaining, and satisfying than extrinsic motivation. For this reason, many efforts in education aim to modify intrinsic motivation with the goal of promoting student learning performance and creativity. But various studies suggest that intrinsic motivation is hard to modify or inspire. Extrinsic, extrinsic motivation occurs when an individual is driven by external influences. These can be either rewarding, money, good grades, fame, etc., or punishing, threat of punishment, pain, etc. The distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation lies within the driving force behind the action. When someone is intrinsically motivated, they engage in an activity because it is inherently interesting, enjoyable, or satisfying. With extrinsic motivation, the agent's goal is a desired outcome distinct from the activity itself. The agent can have both intrinsic and extrinsic motives for the same activity, but usually one type of motivation outweighs the other. One advantage of extrinsic motivation is that it can be used relatively easily to motivate other people to work towards goal completion. One disadvantage is that the quality of work may need to be monitored since the agent might otherwise not be motivated to do a good job. Extrinsic motivation fueling engagement in the activity soon ceases once external rewards are removed. It has also been suggested that extrinsic motivators may diminish in value over time, making it more difficult to motivate the same person in the future. Most people want to change at least one thing in their life, but it can be challenging to find the motivation just to make a start. It helps to understand what motivation means to you so you can find your own ways to get motivated. What is motivation? Motivation is the drive to achieve your goals or needs. It is influenced by how much you want the goal, what you will gain, your personal expectations. Why is motivation important? Motivation is important because it provides you with goals to work towards, helps you solve problems, helps you change old habits, helps you cope with challenges and opportunities. Getting motivated, most people struggle with motivation, but it is even more challenging if you have mental health issues such as depression or anxiety. Here are some tips. Set yourself one specific, achievable goal, think about how to include that goal in your life, what you need to do to make it happen, and then put a time frame on it, such as a week. Dot, break your goal into small, easy tasks and set regular reminders, use your family and friends as support, tell them about your goals and encourage them to help keep you motivated. Ways to keep on track 
make your goal part of your routine by using a diary or app for reminders, positive self-talk is important and effective in managing depression or anxiety. Instead of saying I can't, say I can try. Mindfulness helps keep you relaxed and focused, start a class or join a support group. Support groups can be as effective as professional help, reward yourself when you have completed a step or goal. Ways to stay motivated, here are some tips, regularly review your goals and progress. Seeing progress is a great motivator in itself, and also improves your self-esteem, continue to set new goals. Think about what you want to achieve next week, next month, and next year. Tackle one goal at a time so you don't feel overwhelmed, keep the momentum up. It takes up to three months to develop a new habit, so keeping the momentum and routine helps it feel more automatic over time. Find mentors, a mentor is someone who is experienced in the habit you want to change. Finding social or support groups with the same interest can help you find a mentor. Surround yourself with positive people. Positive friends and family enhance your positive self-talk, which also helps to manage the symptoms of depression and anxiety. Use exercise as one of your daily goals to improve your mental health. What to do if you lose motivation, setbacks are normal, but developing resilience can help you carry on and pick up where you left off. Here are some tips to help you find your motivation again, review your goals and see if they are realistic in the timeframe you have set. You may need to break your goal down further into smaller and more achievable goals. Remember why you wanted to get motivated or reach that goal in the first place take motivation from others, feel inspired by reading a book, talking to your mentor or friends or family who have reached similar goals to the ones you have set. Sometimes you just need to take a break and start afresh. How can I stop procrastinating? Procrastination is often driven by underlying feelings of distress or anxiety elicited by a given task. But there are ways to navigate the discomfort and beat procrastination. You can break the project into small, more manageable pieces, accomplishing one step will fuel your motivation for the next. You can set limits for the time spent preparing to begin, or aim to complete tasks as quickly as possible. You can also set a reward that you'll get after completing the task or a part of it. More intro, Maslow's need hierarchy model, human behavior is goal-directed. Motivation cause goal-directed behavior. It is through motivation that needs can be handled and tackled purposely. This can be understood by understanding the hierarchy of needs by manager. The needs of individuals serves as a driving force in human behavior. Therefore, a manager must understand the hierarchy of needs. Maslow has proposed the need hierarchy model. The needs have been classified into the following in order, physiological needs These are the basic needs of an individual which includes food, clothing, shelter, air, water, etc. These needs relate to the survival and maintenance of human life, safety needs These needs are also important for human beings. Everybody wants job security, protection against danger, safety of property, etc. Social needs These needs emerge from society. Man is a social animal. These needs become important. For example love, affection, belongingness, friendship, conversation, etc. Esteem needs these needs relate to desire for self-respect, recognition, and respect from others. Self-actualization needs. These are the needs of the highest order and these needs are found in those person whose previous four needs are satisfied. This will include need for social service, meditation. Working while you're in school. 1. Advantages. Why is it essential to have a job while a student? There are some definitive benefits of working while you're getting a degree. Among the most obvious, you'll be earning a paycheck. Most of students are doing this out of financial necessity. Having a job also helps reduce your student loan debt because you are more able to afford college. These jobs do offer more than just a paycheck, though. According to studies conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Students who have jobs have higher GPAs than those who do not work. Having a job allows students to apply classroom concepts to the real world. Your primary reason for getting a job may be monetary, but you will also learn people skills, time management, organization, and scheduling. Having a job will also teach you career skills that are vital experience for your future. 
Networking is also super beneficial because connections can lead to careers. You may also have benefits, which not all students have the luxury of having. You can make new contacts, acquire new skills to show off on your CV. Working your way through college can be overwhelming at times, but it can also provide you with valuable experiences that you will thank yourself for down the road. Learning how to balance your work, school, and social life is a skill you will be able to use to your advantage for the rest of your life. It teaches you that life is hard and overwhelming sometimes. Managing stress and time, as well as communication, is vital in this day and age. We are all always on the go and invested in what we are doing. In order to do this, we must learn balance. Working while in school allows you to earn an income and gain professional experience. Two disadvantages, however, working while going to school can also be challenging, can be risky. Can prevent you from fully devoting yourself to your studies. You never want to give up your degree for any reason, especially for your job. A much better career path awaits you within your major. Students may see no point in going to school if they are getting paid for doing a job that doesn't require a degree. Of course, there are tons of people who have succeeded in careers without a degree, but in this day and age, it is so much more beneficial to have one. Having a job and being a student means less free time. Your social life could also suffer. Some people love having free time to devote to friends in college. A job could take away frat parties and social gatherings opportunities from you. This could also lead you to become burnt out and overworked. And ultimately added stress. College is stressful enough, but having a job on top of that may stretch you too thin. In conclusion, working full-time is beneficial for obvious reasons. Being a student is beneficial for obvious reasons. But working full-time and being a student at the same time can be super stressful. You have to weigh these possible challenges in order to determine if having a job while also a student is worth it for you. 3. Balance tips. Even though having an income can give you peace of mind while in school, it could also be too much for a full-time student to handle. Doing both can be overwhelming but rewarding if you are able to find balance and weigh the pros and cons based on how you function. Plan ahead, you just can't let your grades suffer in order to make money. It is absolutely possible for you to study when you work full-time, but you have to do so strategically. Write your tasks down and make a to-do list will not only remind you to complete them on time, but also give you a sense of accomplishment. Look for job opportunities within your department. Working for the department in which you are studying is also a great way to expose yourself to the faculty and students in the department and stay up to date on any opportunities relevant to your course of study. If you desire to work off campus, you should choose to work in the area in which you are obtaining a degree. For example, if you want to be a graphic designer, you could work at an art supply store. Having a job that includes something you love and are passionate about will make it easier to go to work every day. Enjoying your situation and what you do will make working more enjoyable. An internship is also a perfect way for you to get work experience in your career path, yet also make some money. Use any free time to study. For example, you can read a book on the way to work. Also, use a few minutes of your lunch or break time to study. Find your comfort zone, find your study area and a suitable time for studying that will work for you. Where you opt to study is equally as important as the way you study. Remove any distractions such as turning off your phone. And have everything you need once you start. Be aware of your limits, committing to more work than you can handle is very common, so don't panic. Ask yourself, how much work can I cope with? 
And again, prioritize and decide what you need to do first. Get enough rest, take time to decompress. In other words, schedule time for casual play as well. Even if it feels like you don't have the time to spare, it's important to take a break to let your mind recuperate. You can't always work and study. Prioritize your health, remaining healthy both physically and mentally is key. You need to take special care of your health. Sleep a minimum of 7 to 8 hours, or at least try to. Also, be sure to eat nutritious food throughout the day to keep your energy up. Hopefully, these tips will make your life easier if you work and study at the same time. It is an experience that will change your life and the way you see the world of work. Apply these tips and you can take to find the perfect balance of working and studying. Balance tips for going to school while you're working. If you work full-time and find it challenging to find time to study, try some of the methods in this article. Not all of them will work for you, but if one or some do, your education will be much better off. 1. Assess the number of credit hours you can handle. Determine exactly how many classes you can take for every semester. When it comes to work or study, people tend to bite off more than they can chew. If you add education to an already busy schedule, it will just increase the amount of pressure. Keep in mind that you can only do what you are able to do. 2. Keep your boss informed. Assure your employers that you can manage your work schedules. It is also a way to get their attention and consider you to be really eager to work for them. Especially if you're only studying part-time and working more consistently, you should remind your boss when finals are coming up. Let them know as early as possible to make it easy for them to accommodate a bit more time off for you. 3. Use a time management system to manage your time. Schedule time to work on specific academic tasks. Get in the habit of keeping a weekly plan for yourself and ensure that you set aside time for your studies every day. Once you've got a good week plan in place, try to stick to it. Check out your project and do the easy part first. As you begin to build momentum, the more difficult parts will just flow. 4. Find or set up a reliable place to study. Find a go-to spot where you can know you can go and focus on your studies. This applies to getting quality study time in general, which is all the more important if you're working as well. Whether it's a particular nook in the library or a clean desk in your bedroom, make sure the time you spend studying is productive by placing yourself in an environment free of distraction. 5. Use your time wisely to be able to balance work and study. You will need to make sure that the time you spend studying is time well spent. Be productive. Study in short periods with breaks to ensure you stay focused and avoid procrastination. Study with a specific goal in mind, and it will make your study sessions more productive. Sitting down with a specific task or goal in mind will provide direction that can help you get right to work. Further, if you have multiple tasks to complete, you should start with the most challenging or most important task first. 6. Quick study sessions during work breaks. It is absolutely possible for you to study when you work full-time, but you have to do so strategically. Use any free time, even a break. Wake up an hour earlier each day and study, study on days off. Review notes while on your lunch break. Anything helps because small amounts of studying are better than no studying at all. Your grades will thank you in the future. 7. Record and listen to lectures during commutes to work. Listen to audiobook versions of your textbooks while commuting to work or school. Download audio versions of your textbooks and other reading material and listen to them on your way. You could also record your professor's lectures and listen to those as well.
8. Maintaining mental and physical health. Make sure you get enough sleep, eat properly, exercise. You should wake up feeling reasonably rested. In addition, you should take breaks when you are studying, especially if you are feeling worn out. In any case, working or studying for too long can reduce your performance. Eating a healthy meal. Eat breakfast. Not only will this help sustain you throughout the day, it keeps your metabolism in a healthy rhythm. Keep healthy snacks with you. Exercise at the gym or go for a walk a couple of times a week, because physical exercise is an effective stress reliever. Take care of your body and it will also take care of you. 9. Know your limits. If you're constantly stressed, tired, or otherwise not feeling well, you may need to slow down a bit. It's important to take a break to let your mind recuperate. Even on especially busy days, take breaks. Go for a walk around the block and leave your phone at home. Try not to think about what you're working on. You can't always work and study. Conclusion, living both the student and professional life can be tough and put a lot of strain on your personal life. As long as you see your goals and strive to reach them every day, you will be successful. You should never have to choose between food on your table and your education. Finding your balance between both is critical. Take care of your responsibilities and demands, but keep your mental and physical health in mind. Balance your work, study, social life, enjoy your life while doing study. Then again, you can turn this strain into motivation and get great results.